Coming up on today's Airborne, Worldview claims a new record for highest parafoil flight. FAA certifies Fiki system for Cessna TTX, and Cessna Citation M2 receives EASA certification. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The commercial balloon spaceflight company, Worldview, has successfully completed a scaled test flight of its high altitude balloon spaceflight system and claims it has broken the world record for highest parafoil flight in the process. Launching in 2016, Worldview claims it will have voyagers floating peacefully to the edge of space for a two hour sailing like experience within a luxuriously engineered pressurized capsule transported by a parafoil and high altitude balloon. Worldview says the test validated the full flight profile of the space flight system, lifting a 10% scale system to 120,000 feet to the edge of space and back down to 50,000 feet where the transition to a parafoil was successfully executed, unofficially breaking the world record. This allowed for further validation of the precision guided landing system of the space vehicle. Cessna reported that it has certified the flight into known icing system, referred to as FIKI, for their high performance TTX single engine airplane. It can provide up to two and a half hours of protection for most ice attached to the airframe, with minimal impact on the performance. Brian Seal, Cessna TTX business leader, said, quote, the Cessna TTX program has been incredibly successful and certification for the FIKI system is the next important step in the maturing of the aircraft, end quote. The FIKI system uses glycol-based TKS fluid, which is pumped through micro-drilled holes in the titanium leading edges of the aircraft's wings. The propeller and windshield are also protected with TKS fluid. The TTX is an all-composite high-performance aircraft designed specifically for comfort, speed, and luxury, and it draws on its lineage from the Cessna 400 Corvallis. You're watching Airborne. We'll be back after these messages with more news and our feature of the day. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop an email to news spy at aero news.net. Now for some more news from Cessna. The company announced that EASA has certified the Citation M2 business jet, paving the way for deliveries to begin immediately. Cessna's Chris Hearn, their vice president of jets, said, quote, we have had significant interest from European customers for the Citation M2 due to its size, speed, and range, end quote. According to Cessna, the Citation M2 design was driven by customer and pilot feedback. First flight of Citation M2 prototype occurred in March 2012, and the first production unit flew in August 2013. The aircraft received FAA certification in December 2013, and 23 have been delivered through the first quarter of 2014. It's Friday at last, and time for ANN's editor-in-chief to check in with his weekly barnstorming commentary. This week, Jim reminisces about 10 revolutionary years that were brought about by the X-Prize competition. Jim has documented the road to X-Prize in his new, soon-to-be-released book, Beyond the Blue. Here's this week's Barnstorming. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. Well, no politics today. Hooray! Instead, I'd like to talk about something I'm thinking about a little bit over 10 years since the event. Uh, quite some time ago, I became friends with Peter Diamandis, Greg Maranak, and a number of other people who were part of, at that point, the nascent X Prize revolution. Well, 
June 21, 2004 turned out to be one of the most spectacular days of my life as I watched history being made by Burt Rutan's Spaceship One as it not only succeeded in its mission to establish the first suborbital flight conducted by a non-governmental enterprise like that which Bird had put together, but it was also staging for the eventual assault on the XPRIZE itself one just a few months later on flights that occurred September 29th and October 4th of 2004. Before you know it, early morning hours, get ready, so forth and so on, climbed on board a beach starship chase ship, Flew formation with Spaceship One attached to White Knight One, watched it drop away, watched it accelerate to a place well beyond the normal part of our atmosphere, watched the rejoin as Mike Melville worked his way back, and watched history being made. But since then, over the 10 years, in working with XPRIZE and Zero G and Rocket Racing and Google Lunar XPRIZE and the XPRIZE Cup and the various events that surrounded it, what I watched most of all was an extraordinary group of motivated people look at history, make history, and recraft a future for us all. I have never seen a more motivated, more positive, and more expansive view of what people can accomplish when their goals are not only unified, but conducted within the scope of wanting to benefit all. It was truly extraordinary. Since then, XPRIZE has grown to encompass a lot of things besides space. They've been involved in genomics and automotive and oceaneering and ecological and medical and you name it. Really quite extraordinary. But what I'd like to suggest is this. There are some great examples put forth by what Peter and Greg and so many others started when XPRIZE became a reality. I'd like to think that aviation could benefit from its own XPRIZE. Why don't we put together an XPRIZE for ways in which we can build aircraft more efficiently? Let's look at XPRIZES for electric aircraft. Let's look at an XPRIZE for a less expensive alternative power plant, something that could be built for, say, $50 a horsepower, something like that. I mean, there's all kinds of ideas or all kinds of really intriguing concepts that could be put forward. But this business desperately needs the kind of innovative spirit, the kind of progress, the kind of extraordinary vision that XPRIZE encompassed so that the future of aviation doesn't look nearly as dark as it does right now, but instead can be bright and belong to everyone. Happy 10th anniversary to all my friends at XPRIZE. Uh, I'm looking forward to spending some time with some of them at Oshkosh when we celebrate it, especially Tuesday night at Theater in the Woods. But I hope you get a chance to meet some of these people, take a look back at some of the things that were done, and be just as inspired as I was, and still am. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell. According to SpaceX Designs, the company has pushed its pending multi-payload launch until early next month but an exact date has not been announced. It's reported that company engineers say an unspecified potential issue has cropped up with the Falcon 9 booster, and the delay would give the company time to evaluate the problem and correct it if needed. The company had said the mission could have been attempted as late as Tuesday and have planned to leave the rocket at Launch Complex 40 anticipation of a launch this week. But the Air Force has closed the Eastern Range for maintenance work that has been delayed several times. When it launches, the Falcon 9 rocket will carry six Orbcom Generation 2 satellites into low Earth orbit. Airborne is brought to you by some of the best sponsors in the aviation business. We'll be right back with more news. ADS-B will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States. But you can benefit from ADS-B today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADS-B out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Finally, the extraordinary story of the world-changing XPRIZE space competition is being told and illustrated with hundreds of insider photos in Jim Campbell's colorful new book, Beyond the Blue. Journey with Jim as he flies formation with spaceships, plays in zero gravity, prepares rocket racers, and documents the amazing first decade of the personal space race. Available this summer. Get your advance order in now by checking out www.kindredspirit.com. Welcome back. Greenpeace has long been against air travel for the damage they claim it does to the environment, but one of the group's top executives finds it's necessary to fly some 250 miles to work at least twice a month. 
The executive is Pascal Husting, the group's international program director. It's reported that he's making the round trip between Luxembourg and Amsterdam twice a month. According to KLM, the airline that Husting generally flies, each flight between the two cities generates about 142 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions, or the equivalent of burning about 17 barrels of oil, according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Houston said that while he would rather not fly, the trip takes six hours each way by train. However, he said he would be cutting back to one trip per month in December, and that trip would be by train. According to a police officer, remote-controlled aircraft must be kept on a leash. Quadcopter pilot Jonathan Hare was getting set to fly his quadcopter aircraft in a public park to video record some friends when he was approached by two officers who told him it was not allowed. The problem for the officers was that neither of them, or a supervisor who came later, could cite any specific regulations or rules that prohibited the activity. At one point, the supervisor told Hare that leash laws written for dogs applied to remote-controlled aircraft. Could this be a new police tactic to stun the perpetrator with absurdity rather than electricity? Through the entire encounter, Hare remained calm and polite, but refused to be intimidated, though he was not allowed to fly the aircraft in the park. Hare let the video camera run during their entire encounter and posted it on YouTube. Judge for yourself. Well, that's our program. Remember to get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Remember, Airborne is streamed three times a week and is always online. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new edition. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.